chapter eleven of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter eleven where the cold sea raves in the keen fresh october afternoons there was no walk allegra loved better than the walk to neptune point and higher up by winding footpaths to the rashly mausoleum fitting sepulchre for a race born and bred in the breath of the sea a stately tomb perched on a rocky pinnacle at the end of a promontory like a sea-bird's nest overhanging the wave allegra was in raptures with that strange resting-place i like it ever so much better than your cockney-fied cemetery she exclaimed think how grand it must be to lie forever within the sound of the sea the terrible inscrutable sea whose anger means death the calm summer sea whose waves come dancing up the sands like laughing water i wonder whether the rashleys would let me have a little grave of my own somewhere among these crags and hillocks a modest little grave hidden under wild foliage which nobody would ever notice only i should hear the sea just as well as they do in their marble tomb oh allegra how can you talk so lightly of death said isola shocked at this levity to me it is always dreadful to think of and yet it must come poor child said allegra with infinite pity putting her arm round her sister-in-law's slighter figure as they stood by the railing of the mausoleum in the loveliness of an october sunset the sun had just gone down veiled in autumnal haze and behind the long ridge of waters beyond the dodman there glowed the deep crimson of the western sky eastward above the pol rouen hills the moon moved slowly upward amidst dark masses of cloud which melted and rolled away before her oncoming till all the sky became of one dark azure the two girls went down the hill in silence allegra holding isla's arm linked with her own steadying those weaker footsteps with the strength of her own firm movements the difference between the two in physical force was no less marked than the difference in their mental characteristics and allegra's love for her sister-in-law was tempered with a tender compassion for something so much weaker than herself poor child she repeated as they moved slowly down the steep narrow path and do you really shudder at the thought of death i don't i have only a vast curiosity do you remember that definition of sir thomas brown's which martin read to us once death is the lucina of life death only opens the door of the hidden worlds which are waiting for all of us to discover it is only an appalling name for a new birth i love to dream about the infinite possibilities of the future just as a boy might dream of the time when he should become a man look look he said there's a yacht coming in isn't it a lovely sight it was a long narrow vessel with all her canvas spread gleaming with a silvery whiteness in the moonlight slowly and with majestic motion she swept round towards neptune point and the mouth of the harbour there was only the lightest wind and the waves were breaking gently on the rocks at the base of the promontory a night as calm and fair as june look repeated allegra isn't she lovely like a ferry-boat whose yacht can she be i wonder she looks like a racer doesn't she isla did not answer she had seen such a yacht two years ago had seen such a long narrow hull lying in the harbour under repairs had seen the same craft sailing out to mavagasy on a trial trip in the wintry sunlight doubtless there were many yachts in this world of just the same build and character 
they stood at an angle of the hill-path looking up the river and saw the yacht take in her canvas as she came into the haven under the hill that sheltered harbour with its two rivers cleaving the hills asunder one winding away to the right towards laren the other to the left towards turlasco and lostwithiel it looked so perfect a place of shelter so utterly safe from tempest or foul weather and yet there were seasons when a fierce wind from the great atlantic came sweeping up the deep valleys and all the angry spirits of the ocean seemed at war in that narrow gorge to-night the atmosphere was unusually calm and isla could hear the sailors singing at their work slowly slowly the two young women went down the hill allegra full of speculation and wonderment about the unknown vessel isla curiously silent as they neared the hotel a man landed from a dinghy and came briskly up the slippery causeway a tall slim figure in the vivid moonlight loose-limbed loosely clad moving with easiest motion isla turned sick at the sight of him she stopped helplessly hopelessly and stood staring straight before her watching him as he came nearer and nearer nearer and nearer like some awful figure in a nightmare dream when the feet of the dreamer seem frozen to the ground and flesh and blood seem changed to ice and stone he came nearer looked at them and passed them by passed as one who knew them not and was but faintly curious about them he passed and walked quickly up towards the point with the rapid swinging movements of one who was glad to tread the solid earth no it was not lost with you she had thought at first that no one else could look so like him at so short a distance no one else could have that tall slender figure and easy buoyant walk but the face she saw in the moonlight was not his it was like but not the same darker with larger features a face of less delicacy and distinction but oh god how like the eyes that had looked at her with that brief glance of casual inspection were to those other eyes that had poured their passionate story into her own that unforgotten night when she sat out the after-supper waltzes in the anteroom at the talbot she could not have believed that any man living could so recall the man whose name she never spoke of her own free will there were some sailors standing about at the top of the steep little bit of road leading down to the granite causeway and their voices sounded fresh and clear in the still evening mixed with the rippling rush of the water as it came running up the stones the moonlight shone full upon one of the men as he stood with his face towards the sea and isola read the name upon the front of his jersey vendetta vendetta cried allegra quick to observe the name why is not that lord lostwithiel's yacht yes i think so faltered isola then that must have been lord lost with you who passed us just now and yet you would have known him wouldn't you that was not lord lost with you a friend of his i suppose such a nice-looking man too there was something so frank and cheery in his look as he just glanced at us both and marched briskly on he did not pay us the compliment of seeming curious i wonder who he is isla was wondering about something else she was looking with a frightened gaze across the harbour towards that one break in the long golden trail of the moonbeams where the vendetta cast her shadow on the water there were lamps gleaming brightly here and there upon the vessel a look of occupation is lord lostwithiel on board his yacht allegra asked of one of the sailors not ashamed to appear inquisitive no ma'am mr hulbert is skipper who is mr hulbert his lordship's brother was that he who went up towards the point just now yes ma'am 
is he going to stop here long do you know i don't think he knows himself ma'am it'll depend upon the weather most likely if we get a fair wind we may be off to the lizard at an hour's notice and away up north to the hebrides doesn't that seem inconsistent exclaimed allegra as they walked homewards what is the good of coming to cornwall if he wants to go to the hebrides it must be very much out of his way he may want to see his old home perhaps he was born at the mount you know indeed i don't know anything about him but i want to know ever so much i call it an interesting face allegra was full of animation during the homeward walk a stranger of any kind must needs be a godsend as affording a subject for conversation but such a stranger as lost withiel's brother afforded a theme of strongest interest she had heard so much about lord lost withiel and all his works and ways the pity of it that he did not marry the still greater pity that he did not live at the mount and give shooting parties and spend money in the neighbourhood she had heard in a less exalted key of his lordship's younger brother who had fought under beresford in egypt and who had only lately left the navy what more natural than that such a man should sail his brother's yacht captain hulbert was still unmarried but no one talked about the pity of that people took a severely sensible view of his case and were unanimous in the opinion that he could not afford to marry and that any inspiration in that line would be criminal on his part there was an idea at trelasco that the younger sons of peers of moderate fortune have been specially designed by providence to keep up the race of confirmed bachelors there must be bachelors the world cannot get on without them society requires them as a distinct element in social existence and it would ill become the offshoots of the period to shrink from fulfilling their destiny allegra was not the less curious about captain hulbert although his celibate mission had been frequently expounded to her she was interested in him because she liked his face because he was lost withiel's brother because he was sailing a very beautiful yacht because he had appeared in her life with a romantic suddenness sailing out of the sea unheralded and unexpected like a man who had dropped from the moon she fell asleep that night wondering if she would ever see him again if the vendetta would have vanished from the harbour to-morrow at noontide like a boat that had only lived in her dreams or whether the yacht would still be anchored there in the haven under the hill and if so whether captain hulbert would call at the angler's nest and tell them about lost withiel's south american adventures and how he came to be skipper of his brother's yacht at breakfast next morning colonel disney's talk was chiefly about captain hulbert the colonel had been for an early walk and had seen the vendetta from the little quay at fowey by the mechanics institute and had heard who was the skipper i remember him when he and his brother were at eton together nice boys capital boys both of them but i liked jack hulbert better than lost withiel he was franker more spontaneous and impulsive yes jack was my favourite and everybody else's favourite i think when the two were boys i saw very little of them after they grew up i was away with my regiment and jack was away with his ship and lost withiel was wandering up and down the earth like satan i left a card for captain hulbert at the club asking him to dinner this evening you don't mind do you isola isola had no objection to offer and allegra was delighted at the prospect of seeing more of the man with the nice frank countenance and that sea-faring air which most women like i am a dreadful person for being influenced by first impressions she said and that one glance at captain hulbert in the moonlight assures me that i shall like him don't like him too well said martin laughingly for i am afraid he is a detrimental and would make even a worse match than colfox who may be a bishop one day while hulbert has left the navy and is never likely to be anything match detrimental 
cried allegra indignantly can it be my brother who talks in such a vulgar strain as if a woman could not look at a man without thinking of marrying him some women can't answered martin with them every free man is a possible husband indeed i believe there are some who cannot look at a married man without estimating the chances of the divorce court if the man is what they call a catch that is your indian experience exclaimed allegra scornfully i have heard that india is a sink of iniquity she went about her day's varied work as usual curious to see the new acquaintance yet in no wise excited vivid and animated enthusiastic and energetic as she was in all her thoughts and ways gushing sentimentality made no part of miss leland's character life at trelasco flowed with such an even monotony there was such a dearth of new interests that it was only natural that a girl of vivacious temper should be curious about newcomers at st john's wood every day had brought some new element into the lives of the students and almost every day had brought a new pupil drawn thither by the growing renown of the school pupils from the uttermost ends of the earth sometimes pupils of swart complexion speaking unknown tongues pupils patrician and pupils plebeian each and all conforming to the same stringent rules of art spending patient months in the shading of a brace of plums or a bunch of grapes from a plaster cast and toiling slowly up the gradual ascent which leads to the royal academy and the gold medal many there were who sickened at the slow rate of progress and who fell away only the faithful remained and this going and coming this strife between faith and unfaith patience and impatience had made a perpetual movement in the life of the great school to say nothing of such bodily activities as lawn tennis for which the master had provided a court a court for his girl pupils be it noted where they played among themselves as if they had been so many collegians in the college of tennyson's princess allegra had liked her life at the great art school but she had never regretted its abandonment she loved her brother and her brother's wife better even than she loved art it was only now and then that she felt that existence at trelasco was as monotonous as the flow of the river going up and coming down day by day between lostwithiel and the sea she spent the hours between breakfast and luncheon hard at work in her painting-room a little room with a large window facing northward she had the coachman's girl and boy for her models and was engaged upon a little water-colour picture after the school of mrs allingham a little picture which told its story with touching simplicity it was not the first picture of the kind she had painted several of her works had been exhibited at the minor galleries which are hospitable to the newcomer in the world of art and two small pictures had been bought at prices which seemed to promise her an easy road to fortune the coachman's children profited greatly by this new profession which had been devised for them allegra made their frocks in her leisure hours when the active fingers must have something to do while the active tongue ran on gaily in happy talk with martin and isola allegra made up to her little models for their hours of enforced idleness by extra tuition which kept them ahead of most of the other pupils in the village school and allegra supplied them with pocket money i don't know however the children got on before miss leland came said the coachman's wife they seemed to look to her for everything allegra had other models village children and village girls her beauty girl a baker's daughter with a splendid semi-greek face like mrs langtry's whom she dressed up in certain cast-off finery of her own and painted in her genre pictures now in this attitude and now in that imparting an air of distinction which elevated the cornish peasant into a patrician she it was this baker's fair-haired daughter who stood for allegra's successful picture a daughter of the gods divinely tall a little bit of finished painting which had brought the painter five-and-thirty guineas boundless wealth as it seemed to her and ever so many commissions art even in despondency and failure is a consolation 
art successful is an intoxicating delight allegra was as happy a young woman as could be found in cornwall that day when she shut her colour-box dismissed her little maiden and ran down to lunch where she found isola more silent than usual and made amends by her own light-hearted chatter for the morning's absorption over the easel after lunch she ran off to the village to pay her parish visits to the sick and old and on her way to an outlying cottage she met mr colfox who immediately turned to accompany her a way he had but a way to which she had never attached any significance he was a clever well-read man of somewhat original temper who had to pass most of his life among unlettered or dull people therefore it surprised allegra in no wise that he should like to talk to her a bright attractive girl of three-and-twenty is very unsuspicious about the feelings of a homely-looking man at least a dozen years her senior your brother has been good enough to ask me to dinner he said after a little talk about the goodies and their ailments i met him at the club this morning he wants you to meet captain hulbert perhaps you know him already no he has not been here within my time he only left the navy a year ago and he was generally stationed at the utmost ends of the earth keeping guard over our remote possessions have you seen him only for an instant he passed my sister and me yesterday evening in the moonlight i thought he looked a nice person but i think women have a natural leaning towards sailors i could never imagine a seaman telling a falsehood or doing a mean action there is a kind of open-air manner which suggests truthfulness admitted mr colfox yet there have been dark deeds done by sailors there have been black sheep even in the queen's navy however i believe captain hulbert is worthy of your good opinion i have never heard anybody speak against him and the old people who knew him as a lad seem to have liked him better than lord lostwithiel do tell me your opinion of lord lostwithiel i am very curious about him mr crowther talked of him so much the night we were at glenaveril mr crowther loves a lord please satisfy my curiosity is he really such a fascinating personage he has very pleasant manners i don't know what constitutes fascination in a man though i know pretty well what it means in a woman lord lostwithiel's manners are chiefly distinguished by repose without languor or affectation and by an interest in other people so cleverly simulated that it deceives everybody one finds him out by the way in which people boast of his friendship he cannot be so attached to all the world he has a manner which is generally described as sympathetic mr crowther enlarged a good deal upon his lordship's admiration for my sister at the hunt ball was that so very marked mr colfox coloured violently at this direct question assuredly not easy to answer truthfully without hazard of offence i was not at the ball i i heard people talk a little in the way people talk of everything about lost withiel's attention to mrs disney and about her prettiness they all agreed that if not the loveliest woman in the room she was at least the most interesting it was very natural that he should admire her but i don't think martin liked mr crowther's talking about it in that way at the dinner-table the man is horridly underbred has lord lostwithiel what you call she hesitated a little a good character i don't know about the present i have heard that in the past his reputation was not altogether good i understand said allegra quickly the admiration of such a man is an insult and that is why mr crowther harped upon the fact i am sure he is a malevolent man don't be hard upon him miss leland i believe he has only the misfortune to be a cad a cad by birth education and associations don't fling your stone at such a man consider what an unhappy fate it is oh but he does not think himself unhappy he is bursting with self-importance and the pride of riches he is the typical rich man of the psalmist he must be the happiest man in trelasco a thick-skinned man whom nothing can hurt 
i am sorry you think so badly of poor mr crowther because i am really attached to his wife she is one of the best women i know so my sister tells me and i was very much taken with her myself but one cannot afford to be friendly with mrs crowther at the cost of knowing her husband she spoke with some touch of the insolence of youth which sets so high a value upon its own opinions and its own independence and looks upon all the rest of humanity as upon a lower plane and this arrogant youth which thinks so meanly of the multitude will make its own exceptions and reverence its chosen ideals with a blind hero worship for its love is always an upward-looking love the desire of the moth for the star mr colfox sighed and smiled at the same moment a sad little half cynical smile he was thinking how impossible it was to refrain from admiring this bright outspoken girl with her quick intellect and her artistic instincts so spiritual so unworldly and fresh as an april morning how impossible not to admire how difficult not to love her and how hopeless to love he thought of himself with scathing self-contempt middle-aged homely of feature and a figure with nothing to recommend him except good birth a small independence just so much as enabled him to live where he pleased and serve whom he would without reference to the stipend attached to the cure and a little rusty dry-as-dust learning nothing more than this and he wanted to win and wed a girl whose image never recurred to his mind without the suggestion of a rose garden or a summer morning yes she reminded him of morning and dewy red roses those old-fashioned heavy red roses round as a cup and breathing sweetest purest perfume he jogged on by her side in silence and only awoke from his reverie to bid her good-bye at the gate of a cottage garden in the lane that led up the hill to tyward reef end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twelve far too far off for thought or any prayer mr colfox and allegra met again in the drawing-room of the angler's nest at a quarter to eight he was the first to arrive and isla had not yet appeared martin disney was at his post in front of the library fireplace library and drawing-room making one spacious room lighted with candles here and there and with one large shaded lamp on a table near the piano isla had been suffering from headache and had been late in dressing captain hulbert had been in the room nearly ten minutes before his hostess appeared looking pale and ill in her black lace gown and with an anxious expression in her eyes he had been introduced to allegra and was talking to her as if he had known her for years when his attention was called off by isla's appearance and his introduction to her was this martin disney's wife he thought wonderingly such a girlish fragile creature so unlike the woman he had pictured to himself strange that lostwithiel should not have told him of her delicate prettiness seeing that he was a connoisseur in beauty and hypercritical this is just the kind of beauty he would admire thought halbert something out of the common a pale spiritual beauty not dependent upon colouring or even upon regularity of feature the kind of thing one calls soul not having found a better name for it they went in to dinner presently captain halbert and isla mr colfox and allegra the table was a small oval at which five people made a snug little party 
there was a central mass of white chrysanthemums a cheerful glow of coloured venetian glass delicatest pink and jade green under the light of a hanging lamp john halbert looked round him with a pleased expression taking in the flowers the glass the cream white china the lamplight everything and then the two fair young faces one pale and pensive the other aglow with the delight of life eagerly expectant of new ideas they talked of the vendetta and the places at which she had touched lately captain hulbert had spent his summer on the eastern Ligeria between genoa and civita vecchia wasn't it the wrong time of year for italy asked mr colfox no it is the season of seasons in the land of the sun if you want to enjoy a southern country go there in the summer the south is made for summer her houses are built for hot weather her streets are planned for shade her wines her food her manners and customs have all been made for summer time not for winter if you want to know italy at her worst go there in cold weather where did you leave lord lostwithiel disney asked presently i left him nowhere he left me to rove about southern europe left me on his way to corinthia he is like the wandering jew he used to be mad about yachting but he got sick of the vendetta all of a sudden and handed her over to me very generous on his part but the boat is something of a white elephant for a man of my small means i wanted him to sell her wouldn't hear of it to let her not to be thought of i'll lend her to you he said and you shall keep her as long as you like sink her if you like provided you don't go down in her she is not a lucky boat have you sailed her long nearly a year and i love her as if she were bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh let us all go for a sail to-morrow mrs disney to mevagasy or thereabouts we could do a little fishing it would be capital fun what do you say miss leland i should adore it said allegra beaming at him the sea is my passion and i think it is my sister's passion too we are a kind of amphibious creatures living more on water than on land we venture as far as we dare in a row-boat but oh that is such a little way i am afraid that some day you will venture so far that you won't be able to get back again and will find yourselves drifting away to america said her brother isola answered never a word until captain hulbert addressed her pointedly for the second time will you go mrs disney may we make up the party i would rather not she answered without looking at him but why not are you such a bad sailor in spite of all miss leland says of you i am a pretty good sailor in a rowboat but not in a yacht and i hate fishing such a slow weary business i would rather not go i am so sorry but you must not be worried about it said halbert kindly seeing the growing distress in her countenance we will not go in for fishing or excursions but you and miss leland will at least come to afternoon tea on the vendetta to afternoon tea in the harbour there used to be a comic song when i was a boy come and drink tea in the arbour you must come to the arbour with an aspirate it is not so rustic or sentimental but there will be no earwigs or creeping things to drop into your teacup mr colfox you will come won't you i shall be delighted answered the curate i have a sneaking kindness for all yachts the conversation drifted back to lost withiel and his works and ways presently when he went home two years ago he gave me to understand he was going to settle down at the mount and spend the rest of his days in peace and respectability said captain hulbert yet very soon afterwards he and his yacht were off again like the flying dutchman and the next i heard of him was at leghorn and six months later he was coasting off algiers 
and the following spring he was in south america and the vendetta was laid up at marseilles where he begged me to go and look after her and take her to myself until such time as he should want her again i was with him for a few days at leghorn where he seemed ill and out of spirits i don't think you can have used him over well in this part of the world mrs disney he added half in jest i fancy some of you must have snubbed him severely or his tenants must have worried him by their complaints and exactions i could not get him to talk about his life at the mount he seemed to have taken a disgust for the old home you must put that down to his roving temper said disney for although i was away at the time i can answer for it there was no such thing as snubbing in the case your brother is the only peer in these parts and from the way people talk about him he might be the only peer in great britain the alpha and omega of debrett our parvenu neighbour mr crowther talked of him one night with a slavish rapture which made me sick i am a tory by association and instinct but i can't stand the vulgarian's worship of a lord isola looked at her sister-in-law and they both rose at this moment the church almost tumbling over the navy in eagerness to open the door navy winning by a neck they were not long alone in the drawing-room not more than the space of a single cigarette before the men followed then came music and a good deal of talk in the long low spacious room which looked so bright and homely by candlelight with all its tokens of domestic and intellectual life what a capital quarter-deck this is cried john halbert after pacing up and down while he listened and talked and laughed at allegra's little jokes about the narrowness of village life it is delightful to stretch one's legs in such a room as this after six months upon a yacht you will have room enough to stretch your legs at the mount said disney captain halbert had announced his intention of spending a week or two under the family roof-tree while the vendetta underwent some slight repairs and renovations room enough and to spare he said i shan't feel half so jovial walking up and down those grim old rooms as i feel here i shall fancy a ghost pacing behind me clump 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 a slow solemn footstep only the echo of my own tread perhaps but i shall never know for i shall be afraid to look round you ought not to make sport of weak people's fancies for i am sure you don't believe in ghosts said allegra leaning with one elbow on the piano turning over pieces of music absently a graceful figure in a dark green velvet gown cut just low enough to show the fine curves of a full round throat white and smooth as ivory not believing ghosts did you ever know a sailor who wasn't superstitious we are too often alone with the sea and the stars to be quite free from spectral fancies miss leland i can see in your eyes as you look at me this moment that you believe in ghosts believe and tremble tell me now candidly when do you most fear them at what hour of the day or night does the unreal seem nearest to you i don't know she faltered turning over the loose music with a faintly tremulous gesture while isla sat by the piano touching the notes dumbly now and then is it at midnight in the gloaming in the chill mysterious dawn you won't answer shall i guess if you are like me it is in broad daylight between two and three in the afternoon when the servants are all idling after their dinner and the house is silent you are alone in a big bright room perhaps with another room opening out of it and a door a long way off you sit writing at your table and you feel all at once that the room is haunted there must be something 
or some one stealing in at that remotest door you daren't look round you go to the window and look out into the garden or street for a town-house may be just as ghastly as a country one and then with a great effort you turn slowly round and face your terror in the broad garish sunlight in the business hours of the day there is nothing there of course but the feeling has not been the less vivid i know i shall be spectre haunted at the mount you must all come and scare away the shadows mr colfox are you fond of billiards i own to a liking for the game i play with mr crowther and his youngest daughter whenever i dine at glenaveril alicia is a very fine player for a girl and her father plays a good game then you will come up to the mount two or three times a week and play with me i hope there's a decent table cushions as hard as bricks i dare say but we must make the best of it and there's plenty of sound claret in the cellars to say nothing of a keg or two of shydom that i sent home from the hague mr colfox will not make much impression either on your claret or your schnapps said disney laughing he is almost as temperate as one of those terrible anchorites in the novel we were reading the other day homo sum i am glad you put in the qualifying almost said the curate for i hope to taste captain hulbert's shydom the captain expatiated upon what his three new friends and his one old friend martin disney were to do to cheer him in his solitude at the mount there is nothing of the anchorite about me he said i love society i love life and movement i love bright faces he would not leave until they had all promised to take tea on board the yacht on the following afternoon an engagement which was kept by allegra and the colonel but not by isola whose headache was worse after the little dinner party nor by the curate who had parish business to detain him on shore end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter thirteen under the pine wood blind with boughs if isola had any disinclination to visit captain hulbert's yacht her headache only served to defer the evil day for after that first tea-drinking came other invitations and other arrangements fishing parties luncheons off mevagasy entertainments in which isola must needs share when she saw her husband and his sister bent upon the enjoyment of the hour delighted with the vendetta and her warm-hearted skipper they were not john hulbert's only friends in the neighbourhood everybody seemed glad to welcome the rover to his native village almost everybody had known him in his boyhood and there was a general consensus of opinion that he was a much better fellow than his brother he was less courted but he was better liked there had been a touch of cynicism about lostwithiel which frightened matter-of-fact country people one could never feel sure he wasn't laughing in his sleeve at our rustic ignorance said mrs Bainham. i am more at my ease with captain hulbert and my husband and he were great friends when he was a boy they used to go fishing together when Bainham's practice wasn't as good as it is now so the brief indian summer passed in pleasant idleness on a tranquil sea the equinoctial gales had not begun to rage yet there was a lull before the coming of the great winds which were to blow good ships on shore and startle sleepers in the dead of night 
all now was fair and placid sunlit waters golden evenings they spent one bright balmy day off mevagasy a day which was like a long dream to isola as she sat on deck in a low folding chair wrapped in a great feathery rug from the south sea islands with her languid head reclining against a plush-covered cushion one of the many effeminate luxuries which abounded in the cabins below everybody else was intent upon the nets everybody else was full of interest and movement and expectation but she sat apart from all with her ivory knitting needles lying idle in her lap amidst a soft mass of white wool which her industry was to convert into a garment for the baby allegra was enraptured with the yacht she would fain have taken isla down to the cabins to explore their wonders of luxury and contrivance so much comfort and elegance in so restricted an area but isla refused to leave the deck i hate all cabins she said they are always suffocatingly hot so mrs baynham went below with allegra and they too explored the two principal cabins with wondering admiration and even peeped into the cook's galley and the odd little places where steward and sailors contrived to bestow themselves the chief cabin saloon or whatever one liked to call it was as daintily decorated as a lady's boudoir there were nests of richly bound books oriental bronzes and all kinds of continental pottery japanese and indian embroideries venetian mirrors quaint little carved cupboards for wine or cigars every corner and cranny was utilized what a delicious drawing-room cried allegra i could live here all my life fancy how delightful a floating life no such thing as satiety one might open one's eyes every morning on a fresh coast glorified as one sees it across the bright blue water to explore the mediterranean for instance floating from city to city the cities of the past the cities of the gospel the shores that were trodden by the feet of st paul and his companions the cities of the christian saints and martyrs the island birthplaces of greek gods and heroes think mrs baynham a yacht like this is a master key to open all the gateways of the world i would rather have my own cosy little cottage on terra firma answered the doctor's wife in a matter-of-fact mood but this speech of allegra's set the good lady pondering upon the possibility of john halbert falling in love with this nice clever girl and making her mistress of his brother's yacht her friendly fancy depicted the village wedding and those two going forth over the great waters to spend their honeymoon amidst the wonder-world of the mediterranean which the banker's daughter knew only in her atlas he can't be rich she thought but he must have a comfortable income i know his mother had money and allegra can earn a good deal by her painting she wouldn't be an expensive wife we ought all to do our best to bring it about a girl has so few chances in such a place as trelasco she might almost as well be in a convent mrs baynham was at heart a matchmaker like most motherly women whom fate has left childless she was very fond of allegra who was so much more companionable than isola so much more responsive to kindness and affection as she sat on deck in the westering sunlight somewhat comatose after a copious luncheon mrs baynham's idea of helping allegra took the form of a dinner-party which she had long been meditating 
her modest return for numerous dinners which she had eaten at glenaveril and at the angler's nest she considered that three or four times a year it behooved her to make a serious effort in the way of hospitality a substantial and elaborate dinner in which no good things in season should be spared and which should be served with all due ceremony the time was at hand when such a dinner would in a manner fall due and she determined to hasten the date with a view to allegra's interests captain hulbert is sure to be off again before long she told herself so every evening they can spend together is of importance i'm sure he is inclined to fall in love with her already there was not much doubt about his feelings as he stood by allegra in the stern directing the movements of her bare active hands while she hauled in the net not much doubt that he was as deep in love as a man well can be after a fortnight's acquaintance he did not make any secret of his bondage but let his eyes tell all the world that this girl was for him the world's one woman the invitation from mrs baynham was delivered by post next morning as ceremonious a card as if the place were mayfair and the inviter and invitees had not met since last season a copper-plate card with name and address filled in by the lady's pen a detail which distinguished her modest invitation from the glenaveril cards of which there were a variety for at homes tennis dinner luncheon to accept and to decline a fortnight's notice marked the dignity of the occasion the hour of the orthodox quarter to eight we can't refuse isola said disney when his wife handed him the card although my past experience assures me that the evening will be a trifle heavy why will people in small houses insist upon giving dinner parties instead of having their friends in instalments when we go to dine with the baynhams we go for love of them not the people they bring together and yet they insist upon seating twelve in a room that will just comfortably hold eight it is all vanity and vexation of spirit but mrs baynham is so happy when she is giving a real dinner party i don't think we can refuse can we allegra asked isola mrs baynham is a darling and i wouldn't vex her for worlds replied her sister-in-law and in a place like this one can't pretend a prior engagement unless it were in the moon the invitation was accepted forthwith and when captain hulbert dropped in at tea-time it was discovered that he too had been asked and that he meant to accept if his friends at the angler's nest were to be there a thunderbolt fell upon the little village on the following sunday when the old men and women creeping to church a little in advance of younger legs came to the church path they found the gate locked against them locked and barricaded with bars which looked as if they were meant to last till the final cataclysm the poor old creatures looked up wonderingly at a newly painted board on which the more intelligent among them spelt out the following legend this wood is the private property of j vansittart crowther esq trespassers will be prosecuted martin disney and his wife and sister came up when a little crowd of men women and children numbering about thirty had assembled round the gate all in their sunday best what's the meaning of this asked disney ah colonel that's what we all want to know replied old manley the village carpenter a bent and venerable figure long past work i'm over eighty but i never remember that gate being locked as long as i have lived at trelasco and that's all my life colonel there's always been a right of way through that wood 
and there always shall be answered martin disney we won't take any violent measures to-day my friends first because it is sunday and next because one should always try fair means before one tries foul i shall write to mr crowther to-morrow asking him civilly to open that gate if he refuses i'll have it opened for him and i'll take the consequences of the act now my good friends you'd better go to church by the road you'll get there after the service has begun wait till the congregation are standing up and then go into church altogether so that everybody may understand why and by whose fault it is that you are late the appearance of this large contingent after the first lesson created considerable surprise and much turning of heads and rustling of bonnet strings in the echoing old stone church mr crowther stood in his pew of state on one side of the chancel and felt that the war had begun everybody was against him in the matter he knew but he wanted to demonstrate the rich man's right to do what he liked with the things which he had bought the wood was his and he did not mean to let the whole parish tramp across it he received a stiffly polite letter from colonel disney requesting him to reopen the church path without loss of time and informing him of the great inconvenience caused to the older and weaker members of the congregation by the illegal closing of the path during church hours mr crowther sent his reply by the colonel's messenger he asserted his right to shut up the wood which formed a part of his estate and positively refused to reopen the gate at either end of the footpath in question captain hulbert dropped in at his usual hour eager to know the progress of the fight fight there must be he was assured having seen something of mr crowther's bull-dog temper then in the drawing-room of the angler's nest there was hatched a terrible plot a cataline conspiracy in a teacup allegra listening and applauding while the two men plotted that night when the village was hushed in sleep a boatful of sailors landed at the little hard near the railway station at fowry and a half a dozen stalwart blue jackets might have been seen tramping along the old railway track to trelasco one carrying a crowbar another carpenter's basket and under the autumn stars that night in the woods of glenaveril while van sittart crowther slept the sleep of the just man who payeth his twenty shillings in the pound there rose the sound of a sea-song and the cheery chorus of the sailors with a rhythmic accompaniment of hammering and lo when the october morning visited those yellowing woods and when mr crowther's gamekeeper went on his morning round the gate at either end of the church path was wrenched off its hinges and was lying on the ground staple and bolt padlock and iron hinges were lying among the dewy dock leaves and the yellowing fern and there was free passage between the village of trelasco and the house of god van zittart crowther went to plymouth by the first train that could convey him and there consulted the lawyer most in renown among the citizens and that gentleman after due thought and consideration informed him that the closing of such an old established right-of-way as that of the church path was more than any landowner durst attempt whatever omission there might be in the title deeds he had bought the estate subject to that old right-of-way which had been enjoyed by the parish from time immemorial 
he could no more shut it off than he could wall out the sky but i can punish the person who pulled the locks off my gates i conclude said mr crowther swelling with indignation that of course is a distinct outrage for which you may obtain redress if you can find out who did it there can be no difficulty about that the act must have been instigated by the writer of that impertinent letter he pointed to martin disney's letter lying open on the solicitor's table very probably but you will have to be sure of proving his share in the act if you mean to take proceedings against him vansittart crowther was furious how was he to bring the responsibility of this outrage home to anybody when the deed had been done in the dead of night and no mortal eye had seen the depredators at their felonious work his locks and bolts and hinges the best of their kind that sheffield could supply had been mocked at and made as naught and all his dumb dogs of serving-men and women had been lying in their too comfortable beds and had heard never a sound of hammer clinking or crowbar striking on iron there had not been so much as a kitchen-maid afflicted with the toothache and lying wakeful to hear the far-off noise of that villainous deed mr crowther sent for the police authorities of fowry and set his wrongs before them i will give fifty pounds reward to the man who will get me credible evidence as to the person who planned that outrage he said and next day there were bills pasted against divers doors at fowry and trelasco against the mechanics institute and against that curious old oaken door of a mediaeval building opposite the club which may once have been a dungeon and in sundry other conspicuous places beginning with whereas and ending with vansittart crowther's signature nothing came of this splendid offer though there were plenty of people in the district to whom fifty pounds would have seemed a fortune whether no one had seen the crew of the vendetta landing or re-embarking in the night-time or whether some wakeful eyes had seen whose owners would not betray the doers of a deed done in a good cause still remains unknown captain hulbert was enchanted at the success of the conspiracy and went to church next sunday by the now notorious footpath along which an unusual procession of villagers came streaming in the crisp clear air proud to assert a right that had been so boldly maintained by their unnamed but not unknown champion every one felt very sure that the flinging open of the gates had been somehow brought about by martin disney martin whose grandfather they could some of them remember when he came home after the long war with the french and took up his abode in an old house among the hills and married a fair young wife that had happened sixty-five years ago but there were those in the village who could remember handsome major disney with only one arm and a face bronzed by the sun that shines on the banks of the duro captain hulbert went by the church path that morning although it took him ever so far out of his way he wanted to walk to church with the disney family in order to talk over their victory and the disneys seemed to-day to resolve themselves into one and that one was allegra leland for she and the captain walked ahead and discoursed gaily perhaps in too exultant and worldly a vein for pious church people but at worst their exultation was in a good cause for the horn of the lowly was exalted and the pride of the rich man was brought low 
do you think he will be at church asked allegra the pronoun standing for mr crowther of course he will he must brazen out the position he will be there no doubt gnashing his teeth behind his prayer-book if angry looks could kill you and i would be as dead as ananias and sapphira before the end of the service poor silly man why did he want to shut up the footpath speculated allegra only to show his importance to make himself felt in the neighbourhood they wouldn't have him for their representative in spite of his money and his grand church and state principles and all the primrose leaguing of his womankind and so he turns savage and wants to make himself disagreeable yes it was true that mr crowther had stood for lost withiel on three separate occasions and with equal unsuccess on each this may have embittered him if the anger of slighted beauty is a furious thing no less bitter is the sting of wounded vanity in the rejected candidate and then the parson and the doctor had told mr crowther that he could not close his wood against the public an all-sufficient reason why he should make the attempt the crowther family were in the chancel pew in full force allegra thought she detected signs of distress in mrs crowther's countenance but the daughters went through the service with their noses in the air and were more than usually vivacious and conversational among their friends between the church porch and the landau which bore them away to glenaveril and the sumptuous boredom of sunday luncheon merrily went the short autumn days on board the vendetta and merrily went the tea-drinkings and talk in the drawing-room at the angler's nest mrs disney did not often join the yachting expeditions east or west the sea made her head ache she told them but mrs bainham who loved pleasure of any kind was always ready to chaperone allegra and isla welcomed the wanderers to the cheery fireside and the friendly five o'clock tea she spent her own days mostly in the society of her baby with whom she seemed to hold a kind of mysterious commune she had no idea of amusing him as the nurse had none of those conventional tricks and movements which are offered to generation after generation of infants but the child would lie in her lap for hours while she sang to him in her low sweet voice the songs she had learnt in her early girlhood songs that the peasants of brittany sing some of them and others of a somewhat loftier strain she would sing him little bits of mozart those immortal melodies of inexhaustible sweetness and ineffable pathos music mixed with smiles and tears melody interwoven with such melting tenderness as thrills the coldest heart there was a gentle happiness in these solitary hours which the young mother spent with her child and martin disney coming into the room unaware sometimes stood for a minute or so in loving contemplation of that domestic picture the young fair face with its long oval form and delicate features the pensive gravity of the large violet eyes and mournful droop of the thin flower-like lips he had seen such a face on canvas the ideal madonna of raphael with just that subdued blonde colouring and pale auburn hair and just that thoughtful expression his heart swelled with gladness and gratitude as he contemplated mother and son yes the child had made all things well in his home those aching doubts which he felt as he watched beside his wife's sick-bed had vanished like clouds before the sun who could doubt the happiness of the mother absorbed in her first-born 
who could doubt the love of the wife looking up at her husband with such tender welcome as he bent over her shoulder to take the little curled-up fist in his unfold the crumpled fingers and press them to his lips you are very fond of him martin she asked with an often repeated inquiry knowing what the answer would be fond of him after you he is all that i have in this world except allegra who will float away into a world of her own by and by and belong to us no more after me he ought to be first martin your son your heir your second self in the days to come he ought to have the first place in your heart martin for he is your future no one is first but you he dropped the baby hand and took his wife's head between his hands and lifted the fair young forehead looking down at it fondly before he stooped to kiss the soft clustering hair and penciled brows and ivory temples with more than a lover's passion End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter fourteen say the false charge was true the baynham's dinner party was a function to be anticipated with horror and undergone with resignation for the first week after the acceptance of the invitation the ceremony had seemed so far off that it could be talked about lightly and even made an occasion for mirth allegra giving her own little sketch of what a dinner at myrtle lodge would be like the drawing-room with its wealth of chair-backs and photograph albums and the water-colour landscapes which mrs baynham had painted while she was at a finishing school at plymouth never having touched brush or pencil since and mrs baynham's rosy-cheeked nieces from truro who always appeared on the scene of any festivity yes one could tell beforehand what the entertainment would be like one thing they did not know however mrs baynham having been discreetly silent on the subject they did not know that they were to meet the glenaveril family in full force the doctor's wife being of opinion that a friendly dinner-party was the panacea for all parish quarrels and small antagonisms and that by judiciously bringing the crowthers and the disneys together at a well-spread board and in the genial atmosphere of her unspacious drawing-room she could bring about an end of the feud or tacit coldness which had divided the angler's nest and glenaveril since colonel disney's home-coming it was a disappointment to this worthy woman to see vansittart crowther when colonel and mrs disney were announced start and glare as if a mad dog had been brought into the room but she was relieved at seeing the easy nod which the colonel bestowed upon his vanquished foe and the friendly hand which good mrs crowther held out to isola who paled and blushed and all but wept at meeting with that cordial matron i don't know why you never come to see me said mrs crowther confidentially having made room for isola upon a very pretentious and uncomfortable sofa of the cabriole period a sofa with a sloping seat and a stately back in three oval divisions heavily framed in carved walnut a back against which it was agony to lean a seat upon which it was martyrdom to sit but i don't see why we shouldn't be friends when we do happen to meet dear mrs crowther we are always friends i shall never forget your kindness to me 
there there you're a tender-hearted soul i know it grieved me so not to go and see you when you were ill and not to pay attention to your baby such a sweet little fellow too i've given him many a kiss on the sly when i've met him and his nurse in the lanes i suppose mr crowther and the colonel don't hitch their horses very well together that's at the bottom of it all no doubt but as for you and me isola i hope we shall always be good friends this confidential talk between the two women observed by mrs Bainham out of the corner of her eye augured well but mr crowther had not left off glaring and a glare in those protruding eyeballs was awful he usurped the hearth-rug as he laid down the law about the political situation and the impending ruin of the country a feeble policy never maintained the prestige of any country sir he told captain pentreath the half-pay bachelor who was devoted to fishing and cared very little whether his country had prestige or shuffled on without it so long as fish would bite we lost our prestige when we lost beaconsfield and with our prestige we are losing our influence the continental powers leave us out of their calculations the neutral policy of the last ten years has stultified the triumph of british arms from marlborough to wellington the day will come sir when the world will cease to believe in the history of those magnificent campaigns people will say these are idle traditions england could never have been a warlike nation captain pentreath tried to look interested but was obviously indifferent to the opinion of future ages and intent upon watching allegra looking her handsomest in a yellow silk gown and deep in talk with captain hulbert who leant his tall form against mrs bainham's cottage piano which with a view to artistic effect had been disguised in algerian drapery and wheeled into a position that made the room more difficult of navigation one only of the rosy-cheeked nieces was allowed to appear at the dinner-table firstly because the table was a tight fit for twelve and secondly because a thirteenth would have excited superstitious fears the younger sister whom people asked about with tender solicitude was to be on view afterwards when she would perform the bass to her sister's treble in the famous overture to zampa which although not exactly a novelty may be relied upon to open a musical evening with eclat every one had arrived and after a chilling delay potts the local fishmonger who had been a butler and who went out to wait at dinner parties and was as familiar a figure as a saddle of mutton or a cod's head and shoulders made his solemn announcement and with an anxious mind mrs bainham saw her guests parade across the narrow hall somewhat over furnished with stag heads barometers gig whips and umbrella stands to the dining-room while a hot blast of roast meat burst fiercely from the adjacent kitchen mrs bainham had allotted isola to mr crowther determined to carry out her idea of bringing about a friendly feeling mr bainham took mrs crowther and captain pentreath had the privilege of escorting belinda whose sentiments and airs and graces of every kind he knew by heart there was no more excitement in such companionship than in going in to dinner with his grandmother what is the use of being brought in continual association with a handsome heiress if you know yourself a detrimental she would no more look at me as a lover than she would at a pariah dog said the captain when some officious boon companion at the club suggested that he should enter himself for the crowther stakes captain hulbert was made happy with allegra 
and colonel disney was honoured by his hostess to whom strict etiquette would have prescribed the peer's son there was surplus female population in the persons of alicia crowther and mary bainham who agreeably adorned each side of the table with a little extra sweetness and light miss bainham buxom and rosy in a white cashmere frock which she had grown out of since her last dinner-party miss crowther square-shouldered and bony in a black confection by worth with a bloated diamond heart making a mirage upon a desert waste of chest it being a point of honour with thin girls to be more decolleté than their plumper sisters mrs bainham's conversation at one of her own dinners was apt to be somewhat distracted and inconsecutive in substance although she maintained a smiling and delighted air all the time whatever anxieties might be wearing her spirit anxieties about the cooking and the attendants angry wonder at the prolonged absence of the parlour-maid distress at seeing the lobster sauce dragging its slow length along when people had nearly finished the turbot agonising fears lest the vol au vent should not last out after that enormous help taken by captain pentreath in sheer absence of mind perhaps since he only messed it about on his plate while he bored miss crowther with a prosy account of his latest victory over an obstinate demon of the jack family such a devil of a fellow three feet long and with jaws like a crocodile colonel disney was almost as inconsecutive and fragmentary in his conversation as his hostess and did not imitate her smiling aspect he was silent and moody as he had been at the glenaveril dinner more than a year ago that silenus face bending towards his wife's ear that confidential air assumed in every look and tone made him furious he could scarcely sit through the dinner he wounded mrs bainham in her pride of heart as a housekeeper by hardly touching her choicest dishes oh come now colonel disney she pleaded you must take one of my lobster cromskys i don't mind owning that i made them myself it is an entree i learnt from the cook at my own home my father was always particular about his table and we had a professed cook please don't refuse a cromsky colonel disney took the thing on his plate and sat frowning at it while a bustle at the door and a marked rise in the temperature indicated the entrance of the piece de resistance in the shape of a well-kept saddle of mutton oh but you had seen the vendetta before hadn't you asked the oily voice on the other side of the table you knew all about her really now mrs disney was that your first visit to lostwithiel's yacht isola looked at the speaker as if he had struck her great god how pale she was or was it the reflection of the apple-green shade upon the candle in front of her which gave her that ghastly look yes she said i saw the yacht from the harbour years ago but you were never on board her how odd now i had a notion that you must have seen that pretty cabin and all lost with finical arrangements he was so proud of the vendetta when he was here he was always asking my girls on board you remember alicia how lord lost used to ask you two girls to tea yes answered his daughter in her hard voice he asked us often enough but mother would not let us go how very severe said captain hulbert attracted by the sound of his brother's name why do you object to a tea-party on the vendetta mrs crowther have you a prejudice against yachts do you think they are likely to go down in harbour like the poor old royal george 
oh no i'm not afraid of that only i liked lord lostwithiel to come to tea with us at glenaveril and i did not think it would be quite the thing for my girls to visit a bachelor's yacht even if i went with them people at trelasco are only too ready to make unpleasant remarks they would have said we were running after lord lostwithiel oh but it isn't the single girls who run after the men nowadays said mr crowther with his silenus grin it's the young married women they are the sirens nobody took any notice of this remark and the conversation which had become general for a minute or two resumed its duologue form captain halbert and allegra went on with their animated discussion as to the author of macbeth and hamlet and captain pentry took up the thread of his story about the obstinate pike alicia talked to the doctor about her last day with the hounds and mary bainham told mrs crowther about a church bazaar which had electrified truro and at which she had helped at somebody else's stall it was hard work standing about and trying to sell things all day and persuading stingy old gentlemen to put into raffles for talking dolls said miss bainham i have pitied shop girls ever since mrs bainham gave the signal for departure feeling that her dinner from a material point of view had been a success the lobster sauce had been backward and the three last people to whom the vol au vent was offered had got very little except pie crust and white sauce but those were small blemishes the mutton and the pheasants had been unimpeachable and on those substantial elements mrs bainham took her stand she had spared neither pains nor money her italian cream was cream and not cornflour her cabinet pudding was a work of art she felt satisfied with herself and knew that the doctor would approve and yet she felt somehow that the moral atmosphere had not been altogether free from storm cloud colonel disney had looked on at the feast with a gloomy countenance mr crowther had talked in an unpleasant tone i am afraid those two will never forget the church path she thought as she set her nieces down to zampa and then went to inspect the card-table in a snug corner near the fire with its freshly lighted wax candles and new cards placed ready for the good old english game which our ancestors called whist zampa once started meant a noisy evening captain pentreath would sing the maid of Longallan and drink puppy drink mary bainham would murder it was a dream and scream the higher notes in ruby duet would follow solo and fantasia succeed ballad mrs bainham's idea of a social gathering being the nearest attainable approach to a penny reading she would have had recitations and imitations of popular actors had there been any one capable of providing that form of amusement this evening however she failed in getting a quartet for whist neither mr crowther nor his wife was disposed for cards colonel disney coldly declined and it was useless to ask the young people to leave the attractions of that woody piano while she was lamenting this state of things the whist table being usually a feature in her drawing-room the disneys and allegra bade her good-night and were gone before she had time to remonstrate with them for so early a departure it seemed earlier than it really was for the dinner had been late disney's quick ear had heard the step of his favourite horse punctual as the church clock he had ordered his carriage at half-past ten and at half-past ten he and his party left the drawing-room the doctor following to hand the ladies to their carriage while the colonel lighted a cigar on the doorstep preparatory to walking home 
it's a fine night i'd rather walk he said he walked further than the angler's nest he walked up to the hill where he and isola had sat in the summer sunshine on the day after his home-coming he roamed about that wild height for two hours and the church clock struck one while he was in the lane leading down to trelasco if that man has any motive for his insolence if there is any secret between him and my wife i'll wring the truth out of him before he is a day older the colonel said to himself as he tramped homewards he wrote to mr crowther next morning requesting the favour of half an hour's private conversation upon a very serious matter he proposed to call upon mr crowther at twelve o'clock if that hour would be convenient the bearer of the note would wait for an answer mr crowther replied that he would be happy to see colonel disney at the hour named the colonel arrived at glenaveril with military punctuality and was forthwith shown into that grandiose apartment where all those time-honoured works which the respectable family bookseller considers needful to the culture of the country gentleman were arranged in old oak bookcases newly carved out of soft chestnut wood in the workshops of venice it was an imposing apartment with panelled dado gilded japanese paper heavy cornice and ceiling in carton pierre such a room as makes the joy of architect builder and furniture maker so far as dignity and social position can be bought for money those attributes had been bought by vansittart crowther and yet this morning standing before his mediaeval fireplace with his hands in the pockets of his velvet lounge coat he looked a craven he advanced a step or two to meet his visitor and offered his hand which the colonel overlooked fixing him at once with a gaze that went straight to the heart of his mystery he felt that an accuser was before him that he vansittart crowther was called to account mr crowther i have come to ask what you mean by your insolent manner to my wife insolent my dear colonel disney i admire the lady in question more than any other woman within twenty miles surely it is not insolent to admire a pretty woman it is insolent to adopt the tone you have adopted to mrs disney first in your own house on the solitary occasion when my wife and i were your guests and next at the dinner-table last night i took no notice of your manner on the first occasion for though i considered your conduct offensive i thought it might be your ordinary manner to a pretty woman and i considered i did enough in forbidding my wife ever to re-enter your house but last night the offence was repeated was grosser and more distinctly marked what do you mean by talking to my wife of lord lostwithiel with a peculiar emphasis what do you mean by your affectation of a secret understanding with my wife whenever you pronounce lord lostwithiel's name i am not aware that there has been anything peculiar in my pronunciation of that name or in my manner to mrs disney said mr crowther looking at his boots but with a malignant smile lurking at the corners of his heavy lips oh but you are aware of both facts you meant to be insolent and meant other people to notice your insolence it was your way of being even with me for defying you to shut up the wood yonder and cut off the people's favourite walk to church you dared not attack me but you thought you could wreak your petty spite upon my wife and you thought i should be too dull to observe or too much of a poltroon to resent your impertinence that's what you thought mr crowther and i am here to undeceive you and to tell you that you are a coward and a liar 
and that if you don't like those words you may send any friend you please to my friend captain hulbert to arrange a meeting in the nearest and most convenient place on the other side of the channel mr crowther turned very red and then very pale it was the first time he had been invited to venture his life in defence of his honour and for the moment it seemed to him that honour was a small thing a shadowy possession exaggerated into importance by the out at elbows and penniless among mankind who had nothing else to boast of as if a man who always kept fifty thousand pounds at his bankers and who had money invested all over the world would go and risk his life upon the sands of blankenberg against a soldier whose retiring allowance was something less than three hundred a year and who was perhaps a dead shot the idea was preposterous no mr crowther was not going to fight and though he quailed before those steady eyes of martin disney's calm in their deep indignation this explanation was not unwelcome to him he had a dagger ready to plunge into his enemy's heart and he did not mean to hold his hand i'm not a fighting man colonel disney he said and if i were i should hardly care to fight for a grass widow who made herself common talk by her flirtation with a man of most notorious antecedents we will say that it never was any more than a flirtation in spite of mrs disney's mysterious disappearance after the hunt ball which happened to correspond with lord lostwithiel's sudden departure the two events might have no connection more especially as mrs disney came back ten days later and lord lostwithiel hasn't come back yet i can answer for my wife's conduct sir under all circumstances and amidst all surroundings you are the first person who has ever dared to cast a slur upon her and it shall not be my fault if you are not the last i tell you again to your face that you are a coward and a liar a coward because you are insolent to a young and lovely woman and a liar because you insinuate evil against her which you are not able to substantiate ask your wife where she was at the end of december the year before last the year you were in india ask her what she had been doing in london when she came back to fowry on the last day of the year and travelled in the same train with my lawyer mr mcallister who was struck by her appearance first because she was so pretty and next because she looked the picture of misery got into conversation with her and found out who she was if you think that is a lie you can go to mcallister in the old jewry and ask him to convince you that it is a fact there is no occasion my wife has no secrets from me i am glad to hear it then there is really nothing to fight about except a good deal of vulgar abuse on your part which i am willing to overlook a man of your mature age married to a beautiful girl has some excuse for being jealous more excuse perhaps than a man of your age has for acting like a cad said the colonel turning upon his heel and leaving mr crowther to his reflections those reflections were not altogether bitter mr crowther felt assured that he had sown the seeds of future misery he did not believe in the colonel's assertion that there were no secrets between him and his wife he had cherished the knowledge of that mysterious journey from london on the last day of the year he had warned his confidential friend and solicitor to mention the fact to no one else he had pried and questioned and by various crooked ways had found out that isola had been absent from the angler's nest for some days after the hunt ball and he had told himself that she was a false wife and that martin disney was a fool to trust her as for being called by harsh names he was too much a man of the world to attach any importance to an 
angry husband's abuse it made him not a sixpence the poor and as there had been no witness to the interview it scarcely diminished his dignity the thing rested between him and his enemy he took down my gates but i think i have given him something to think about that will spoil his rest for many a night before he has thought it out mused mr crowther it was after the usual luncheon hour before martin disney went back to the angler's nest he had been for a long walk by the river trying to walk down the devil that raged within him before he could trust himself to go home his wife was alone in the drawing-room sitting by the fire with her baby in her lap but this time he did not pause on the threshold to contemplate that domestic picture there was no tenderness in the eyes which looked at his wife only a stern determination every feature in the familiar face looked strange and rigid as in the face of an accuser and judge send the child away isola i want some serious talk with you she stretched out a faltering hand to the bell looking at him pale and scared but saying no word she gave the baby to his nurse presently in the same pallid dumbness never taking her eyes from her husband's face martin she gasped at last frozen by his angry gaze is there anything wrong yes there is something horribly wrong something that means destruction what were you doing in london the winter before last while i was away what was the motive of your secret departure your stealthy return what were you doing on the last day of the year where had you been with whom she looked at him breathless with horror whether at the accusation implied in his words or at his withering manner it would have been difficult for the looker-on to decide his manner was terrible enough to have scared any woman as he stood before her waiting for her answer where had you been with whom he repeated while her lips moved mutely quivering as in abject fear great god why can't you answer why do you look such a miserable degraded creature self-convicted not able to speak one word in your own defence on the last day of the year she faltered with those tremulous lips on the last day of the year before last the winter i spent in burma what were you doing where were you where had you been is it so difficult to remember no no of course not she cried with a half hysterical laugh you frighten me out of my senses martin i don't know what you are aiming at i was coming home from london on that day of course the thirty first of jan no december coming home from hans place where i had been spending a few days with gwendolen you never told me of that visit to gwendolen oh yes i'm sure i told you all about it in one of my letters perhaps you did not get that letter i remember you never noticed it in yours martin for god's sake don't look at me like that i am looking at you to see if you are the woman i have loved and believed in or if you are as false as hell he said with his strong hand grasping her shoulder her face turned to his so that those frightened eyes of hers could not escape his scrutiny who has put this nonsense in your head your neighbour your good mrs crowther's husband told me that his lawyer travelled with you from paddington on the thirty first of december the year before last he got into conversation with you you remember perhaps no she cried with a sudden piteous change in her face i can't remember but you came from london on that day you remember that yes yes i came from gwendolen's house on that day i told you so in my letter that letter which i never received telling me of that visit to which you made no allusion in any of your later letters it was about that time i think that you fell off as a correspondent left off telling me all the little details of your life which in your earlier letters seemed to shorten the distance between us 
she was silent listening to his reproaches with a sullen dumbness as it seemed to him while he stood there in his agony of doubt in his despairing love he turned from her with a heart-broken sigh and slowly left the room going away he scarce knew whither only to put himself beyond the possibility of saying hard things to her of letting burning branding words flash out of the devouring fire in his heart she stood for a few moments after he had gone hesitating breathless and frightened like a hunted animal at bay then ran to the door opened it softly and listened she could hear him pacing the room above again she stood still and hesitated her lips tightly set her hands clenched her brow bent in painful thought then she snatched hat and jacket from a corner of the hall where such things were kept and put them on hurriedly with trembling hands as if her fate depended upon the speed with which she got herself ready to go out looking up at the great dim brazen face of the eight-day clock all the while and then she let herself out at a half-glass door into the garden and walked quickly to a side gate that opened into the lane the gate at which the baker and the butcher stopped to gossip with the maids on fine mornings there was a cold bracing wind and the sun was declining in a sky barred with dense black clouds an ominous sky prophetic of storm or rain isla walked up the hill towards tyradreeth as if she were going on an errand of deadliest moment skirted and passed the village with no slackening of her pace and so by hill and valley to par a long and weary walk under ordinary circumstances for a delicate young woman although accustomed to long country walks but isla went upon her lonely journey with a feverish determination which seemed to make her unconscious of distance her steps never faltered upon the hard dusty road the autumn wind that swept the dead leaves round her feet seemed to hold her up and carry her along without effort upon her part past copse and meadow common land and stubble she walked steadily onward looking neither to right nor left of her path only straight forward to the signal lights that showed fiery red in the grey dusk at par junction she watched the lights growing larger and more distinct as she neared the end of her journey she saw the fainter lights of the village scattered thinly beyond the station lamps low down towards the sandy shore she heard the distant rush of a train and the dull sob of the sea creeping up along the level shore between the great cliffs that screened the bay a clock struck six as she waited at the level crossing and in an agony of impatience while truck after truck of china clay crept slowly by in a procession that seemed endless and then for the first time she felt that the wind was cold that her thin serge jacket did not protect her from that biting blast finally the line was clear and she was able to cross and make her way to the village post office her business at the post office occupied about a quarter of an hour and when she came out into the village street the sky had darkened and there were heavy raindrops making black spots upon the grey dust of the road but she hurried back by the way she had come recrossed the line and set out on the long journey home the shower did not last long but it was not the only one she encountered on her way back and the poor little jacket was wet through when she re-entered by the servant's gate and by the half-glass door creeping stealthily into her own house and running upstairs to her own room to get rid of her wet garments before any one could surprise her with questions and sympathy it was past eight o'clock though she had walked so fast all the way as to feel neither cold nor damp she took off her wet clothes and dressed herself for dinner in fear and trembling imagining that her absence would have been wondered at and her errand would be questioned it was an infinite relief when she went down to the drawing-room to find only allegra sitting at her easel working at a sepia sketch by lamplight martin is very late she said looking up as isla entered and he is generally a model of punctuality i hope there is nothing wrong where have you been hiding yourself since lunch isa have you been lying down yes part of the time hesitatingly it is very late 
twenty minutes to nine dale has been in twice in the last quarter of an hour to say that the dinner is being spoiled hark there's the door and martin's step thank god there is nothing wrong cried allegra getting up and going out to meet her brother colonel disney's countenance as he stood in the lamplight was not so reassuring as the substantial fact of his return it was something to know that he was not dead or hurt in any desperate way victim of any of those various accidents which the morbid mind of woman can imagine if husband or kinsman be unusually late for dinner but that things were all right with him was open to question he was ghastly pale and had a troubled half distracted expression which scared allegra almost as much as his prolonged absence had done i am sure there is something wrong she said when they were seated at dinner and the parlour-maid had withdrawn for a minute or two in pursuance of her duties having started them fairly with the fish oh no there is nothing particularly amiss i have been worried a little that's all i am very sorry to be so unconscionably late for dinner and to sit down in this unkempt condition but i loitered at the club looking at the london papers i shall have to go to london to-morrow isola on business and i want you to go with me have you any objection she started at the word london and looked at him curiously surprised yet resolute as if she were not altogether unprepared for some startling proposition on his part of course not i would rather go with you if you really have occasion to go i really have it is very important you won't mind our deserting you for two or three days will you allegra asked disney turning to his sister mrs bainham will be at your service as chaperone if you want to go out anywhere while we are away it is an office in which she delights i won't trouble her i shall stay at home and paint all the time i have a good deal of work to do to my pictures before they will be ready for the winter exhibition and the time for sending in is drawing dreadfully near you need have no anxiety as to my gadding about martin you will find me shut up in my painting-room come home when you will later when she and her brother were alone in the drawing-room she went up to him softly and put her arms around his neck martin dearest i know you have some great trouble why don't you tell me is it anything very bad does it mean loss of fortune poverty to be faced this pretty home to be given up perhaps no 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 my dear the home is safe enough the house will stand firm as long as you and i live i am not a shilling poorer than i was yesterday there is nothing the matter nothing worth speaking about blue devils vapours if you like that's all you are ill martin you have found out that there is something wrong with you heart lung something and you are going to london to consult a physician oh my dear dear brother she cried with a look of agony her arm still clasped around his neck don't keep me in the dark let me know the worst there is no worst allegra i am out of sorts that's all I am going to town to see my lawyer. End of chapter 14